Welcome, everyone. I am uh, Arn van Alstafjord, and I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Consortium for Service Innovation. And I lead the training and certification arm of the consortium. And the consortium is a nonprofit alliance of member companies. And we've developed innovative ways to improve engagement in a variety of areas. So these include customer service, HR support, IT support, sales, and customer success, to name a few. And it's always nice to hear about where other people are uh, finding new ways um, to leverage the consortium's work in new areas. And we're funded predominantly by our member companies. And we'd like to thank them for their ongoing support. And included here are the benefactor and sponsor level members. And then we organize our work. Next slide into these um, five buckets. So we're definitely very known for knowledge-centered service, but intelligence swarming is, is taking off a lot of work now in predictive customer engagement. Um, and as well as the overall customer engagement initiative, how you package that for your, your customers. And then uh, leadership is absolutely key. And we see that they were individual standalone buckets, but they are really blending. And um, we've seen recently that the, uh, like the understanding and optimizing success by channel is a great example of how they're really blending here. And uh, next slide, we have a variety of ways for members to engage um, from very broad to um, very focused events. And we open up some of these events to the public as we're doing with this one. Signature event from April 9th, April 11th, we'll be hosting our annual member summit. And this is open, well, we call it the member summit. It's open to both members and non-members. And we'll explore the intersection of empathy and AI assisted knowledge sharing, as well as many other topics. So, and we have open space for those who've come there. So it's a, just a great way to engage with your peers. Mm. And so for today's uh, KCS in action, I am pleased to introduce David Kay from DBK and Associates. And uh, David is a KCS V6 certified trainer and a KCS V6 aligned service provider. And David's a longtime contributor to the consortium and was recognized as a consortium innovator way back in 1999. So he was one of the uh, one of the first. And I had the pleasure of bringing David into my company around that time frame to help kick off our KCS implementation. So I've had the pleasure of uh, knowing David for a very long time. And then in uh, this session, David will show us over a dozen ways that Gen AI can make KCS quicker and easier. And some of them are gonna be pretty surprising to you. But he's also gonna discuss some use cases that don't seem to work and, and the why. And they befitting a talk title in action, um, David's gonna show specific inputs, outputs, and prompts that you can immediately use and build upon in your environment with your data. And so the examples are gonna span both the solve and evolve loops and are gonna help all your audience, the knowledge workers, program team, coaches, managers, and your KDEs. And I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to David. Well, thank you so much, Arnfin. I really appreciate it. I uh, appreciate the opportunity and uh, it has been wonderful working with the consortium for the last many, many years. Um, we are a boutique consulting firm. Um, we've been in business for 21 years now or next month. And really what we do uh, to kind of summarize this slide is to help organizations take the great ideas that consortium members and the consortium come up with and put them into practice. So our primary focus is KCS. Uh, and that of course is the primary focus of our AI conversation today. I expect essentially 100% of you have run into an exec who has said something like this, like just, I, oh, it's the greatest new knowledge management technology. Why don't you just throw some chat GPT at it and, and you know, we'll have, conversations with our customers and it'll all be wonderful. If only it were that easy. A group of, uh, of folks in the consortium um, discovered or identified the pumpkin totalit as kind of a model for this application of uh, AI. Like just, let's just, you know, put chat, chat GPT on top of it. Now this hapless frog 
let's stop the misery. This hapless frog is um, very good at jumping. Unfortunately, it doesn't know where to jump and it doesn't know where it's going. And so it's incredibly bad at landing. And we don't want to be pumpkin totalets. And the, the only way that, that we know of making sure that we're going to get any benefit out of our AI initiatives, whatever they happen to be, is to have a plan. And in the case of AI, it means having a use case. We feel so strongly about that, that there is now a what's your use case t-shirt and you know other swag in the consortium Zazzle store. So we can wear that in front of executives and remind them that they do not want to be pumpkin toadlets. So today's conversation is going to be all about use cases. My goal for the presentation today, I, I really have two. One of them is to share with you some of my experiments in using generative AI. All of these will be based on uh, GBT4, that's just the platform I happen to use. As so I'm gonna share specific use cases with you that I've tried and some of the results that I've gotten. But I am one person and not even necessarily the most qualified to do this experimentation. And I know for a certainty that many, many, many people on this KCS in action have also been experimenting probably in some of the same areas because we're all focused on KCS. So as Arnfin mentioned, uh, as I share some use cases with you, I would really please love to hear from you and have us all hear from you in the chat um, what you've done, what, you know, what, what outcomes were similar to what I'm seeing, what outcomes were different, um, how you engineered prompts to get to better outcomes, uh, as I'm sure many of you have. So I'm seeing the use cases I'm going to show not as anything like the last word, but as a nucleation site for, you know, good ideas and good conversations to bubble up. So please, I encourage you, the consortium folks um, will be able to bring some of those observations uh, into the meeting. Um, that is an explicit objective uh, because this is a consortium event and that's how we advance and work together is by sharing our ideas. Uh, one note about data, two notes about data. First one is, I am painfully aware that many of you today cannot share, are not allowed to, don't believe you should share data, particularly anything related to customers uh, with these online systems. And I think there's a lot of kind of sorting out and figuring out that's going to need to happen. Um, I'm going to pretend that problem, which is very real and very serious, doesn't exist. So... Uh, I'm assuming a solution to that problem, certainly not my area of expertise. And, uh, and, and so we can continue on with our experiments. Now we're a consulting firm. And so we don't have a support organization and, uh, we don't, you know, have case data from our clients, right? We, we sometimes see it but it keeps this risk and compliance manager happy and it keeps our clients risk and compliance people happy to know that there is no case data anywhere in our infrastructure. What I do have in terms of, of access to data is many wonderful KCS practitioners have put their articles out on the web, um, which is a great idea in our opinion. So Anything that comes from a knowledge base article that you see will come from a company that we believe uh, practices KCS very well, and it comes from their public knowledge. And in all of those cases, I provided a URL um, if you want to explore further. 
for the case data itself, um, the only thing that I have that I felt comfortable sharing um, with these systems are, are cases that I have opened. Um, and so I've got customer service. Uh, I've got technical support chat transcripts. Um, I have one enormously long email thread uh, for a deeply complicated technical support problem that I had that ran over a, a number of months. And so that is the input that I have been using. So it's it's not an enormously broad data set, but it's certainly good enough for experimentation. So the first use cases I'm going to explore feel kind of like small ball to me. They don't feel like big deals, but I've been doing this long enough to know that there are some barriers to people participating in the solve loop that, you know, I've got the curse of knowledge. I don't really even understand why these barriers exist, but it doesn't matter what I think. The reality is I hear over and over again from clients that there are barriers that their people run into. And I think generative AI can really help some of these. And the first one I want to look at is bulletizing stuff. You know, in case yes, we have this structure. Structure is very important uh, to, to KCS. And part of that structure is that within templates, um, we do, you know, lists of bullets for symptoms or environmental considerations. We do numbered series of steps for resolutions or procedures, right? So some people apparently really struggle with this. So um, we took, um, I kind of debulletized an Extreme Networks KCS article. And um, I've kind of highlighted the part of the prompts here that tell the system what to do. Um, and, and then the rest is kind of the data. So I took this very wonderful KCS article that they have out online and asked it to get bulletized. And this is what it came out with. So... Um, one of the things that kind of blew me away a little bit when I saw it is the fact that the actual, you know, computer input and th that that you would, you know, type in a file or in the command line, um, it knew enough to bold that. Um, I had a, a version of it once where it even sort of offset it in a Stack Overflow style code box. Um, and you know, that was just, it recognized that. And, uh, so I think, you know, if you were leading the KCS program and asking people to create articles, they would, you'd want them to look a lot more like this than what was on the previous screen. So for people who struggle with this, um, this kind of bulletizing and formatting, um, this, this can help. There's another solve loop barrier that we see, again, that I'm not sure I understand, but I believe is real. Uh, most of our clients have multiple templates uh, for knowledge-based articles. They essentially always have a solution or a break-fix version, uh, and they often have one or both of a how-to and a question and answer. Sometimes they merge them together. And they're really at, at some high level, and I know this, this is very important to Greg Hoxton, uh, at some high level, they're really the same underneath, but the labels that you want to use are different in different contexts. And I've never seen a single set of labels that cover all of these article use cases well. So uh, so for most people, picking the right article template is not much of a challenge, but for some people it is. And, and sometimes people even say, yeah, I know it's suboptimal to only have one article type, but are people, you know, really you know, it takes time and thought and a lot of extra effort to pick the article type. So um, I fed a number of um, pieces of articles or articles uh, into the system 
uh, the example I'm going to use and why I've got the dot, dot, dot is exactly the same input text that you saw in the last one. But I, so I'm not taking you exhaustively through all the variations that I tried of this, but um, the system did a good job generally of determining what article template to use. Part of it, I think, was cued by some of the labels, but I also did it without labels, and it was it was able to um, to identify article types well. So this may be something that eliminates a speed bump for solve loopers. Uh, Pat's got a good observation here um, that dynamic content creation is only as good as documentation in the case or service request or ticket or incident, um, and this is kind of a central thesis of this presentation, right? Is there is no magic here. doesn't matter how smart AI is. Garbage in, garbage out is as true in 2023 as it was in 1971. So um, this is, this is a very real thing. So uh, let me see. Are you, uh, Elena asked about the prompts that um, to bulletize and, and get text on the template. Very simple, very simple. There, there are times that I ended up trying um, much more complex prompts, but simple seemed to uh, seem to work just fine in these two use cases that I just went on. I know that um, Brian, yeah, so yeah, Brian is one of the many people that I've learned this from, that it really can be a struggle to pick um, the article type. And uh, to, to Ryan's point about following the content standard, uh, we have, in a number of these things, we have basically given it an article template. So I've not gone so far as to encode much more of the content standard, for example, when you might or might not format articles. But um, but at least the template part of it, yes. And it, it seems to know how to follow templates. And I'm going to let you read Corey's observation, uh, which is uh, which is an enormously interesting question. Um, also, when you throw in tools that are designed or observation, when you're um, looking at tools that are designed explicitly to break these models. The last one of these little solve loop barriers actually uh, um, I think is less little than the other ones, and that is titles. So the funny thing about the tools that we use typically to do knowledge management and to, to create articles, um, I mean, we're creating the articles, we're working the case, but then if, you know, when we go to... Um, to to literally create the article from that data in the case in the knowledge management system. What's at the top? 100% of the time, title or short description or whatever your system happens to call it. And of course, we are wired in this culture to start at the top left and end up at the bottom right. And at the top left is the title. And you never want to start with a title. Never, ever. It's like, you know, if you are writing a report, the executive summary is the very last thing that you write, right? Because once the rest of the report is done, you know what to put in the executive summary. Same thing with the knowledge base article. Once the knowledge base article is written, then you're in a good position to create a title. And, and titles are tough. You don't have much space. Um, you generally want to include some environment and uh, symptoms in it. Uh, and you want those to be high level, but you also want the title to be unique. So um, I, I did not work on the unique part because I think that is more of a search thing. But we did look at, again, just for consistency across these for continuity, uh, in this particular case, we used the same article that we've been looking at. A uh, good title and good short title. And um, 
both of these, right, if I were facilitating a workshop where people were creating articles and they'd come up with these titles for the content that was there, I would... <laughs> I would say well done, right? These are these are very good, very descriptive titles. So we we know that these systems are good at summarizing. And this just shows me that this and other examples shows me that the system is not only good at summarizing, but that summarization can take the form of a title. Article summaries. Yes, yes, Daniel. That is um summarization is is really one of the clear um use cases right and uh, good observations about uh, uh uh from from jacob i want to tip my hat to uh to julie moore for a phrase that i think you know really sums up what's wonderful about generative ai She's a, a senior forester analyst. She's been um, a, a very long time practitioner and support, supporter uh, of KCS over the years, uh, not as part of the consortium, uh, but, but uh, a KCS advocate nonetheless. And she describes the power of, or the, what generative AI can do is the power of the first draft. And I think most of us who have used Gen AI to help us do our own jobs um, really can resonate with that. I can't ever imagine with today's state of technology, I can't ever imagine taking something generated by GPT-4, for example, and turning it in as work product, right? It, it doesn't sound like me. It's often too wordy. Even if it's summarizing, uh, it gets things wrong. Uh, Kelly Murray has done a great job of highlighting uh, Zoom chat transcript and summarization facts that are just completely absurd, right? So we're not going to just take what the AI gives us. But if we think about it in terms of a first draft, that can really help. And uh, so here's where I'm going to visit that uh, very long email thread that I had with, um, I was changing the calendar and ticketing management software uh, on our website to be away from a big commercial, incredibly expensive one to being a WordPress plugin. And it took uh, several months for us to be able to get it to handle payments. And I'm going to say the support people that I worked with were wonderful. It was, I'm not, this is not a, the fact that it took long is not a critique of them. It was a sort of weird and interesting situation. So um, yeah, I had a thousand line email thread with no repeats. This was just you know, just one time of everything. And they, um, we covered a lot of ground. Um, much of it was wrong. So for example, this idea of deactivating all my must use plugins, um, ended up not being right. I mean, a, it didn't fix it and B they're called must use for a reason. And so they were going to get turned on, you know, later. So we we explored a lot of blind alleys here. And uh, it turned out that adding this bit to the prompt, do not describe unsuccessful solutions, ended up being really important. So when I gave this prompt to this long email thread, and yeah, I did have to cut it down just a little bit manually, mostly. I just got rid of the tier one stuff but to have it be um, short enough that GPT-4 would accept it. It came back. It turns out the comment that it's likely to be a cash issue, turns out that was 100% exactly right. So um, this is a fabulous summary 
in six lines of a uh, more than a thousand line thing. So there's comments in the chat about good at summarizing. Uh, this this is was really mind blowing to me that it was able to get to the ultimate resolution. The thing that I did next is to take this summary of the ticket and ask how to resolve the issue the next time it occurs. Because, of course, that's the point of KCS articles. And it came up with this. Now, as I often tell people when I'm coaching article creation, even if the article is imperfect and even if I'm about to make a lot of suggestions, the world would is a better place with this article in it, even though it's, you know, it's it's not perfect. And I would say if this an article with a resolution that looked like this had existed, the world would be a much better place for it, right? We it would not have taken months. Um I am, though, sort of a connoisseur of KCS structured articles. And one thing I do when I'm involved in a customer support experience, just kind of for practice and maybe to show off a little bit, is I always send the person who resolved the issue back a knowledge base article describing it. And so if, if there weren't one already. So um, in this case, prior to ever thinking about chat GPT, I had written this knowledge base article and and sent it back to them and of course i'm biased but as somebody who really lived with this issue for quite some time i will tell you that i believe that this human created knowledge base article in this case is better than the other things i've seen so the world would be better with the chat gpt generated article than without the article, which is was the situation at the time, I think the world would be yet better if we used uh, this article instead. Chat DBK, uh, thank you very much. Oh, great. So lots of, um, lots of great uh, observations. And I am very glad that um, Kelly told us that we will be getting a copy of the chat because I want to be able to um, really sink my teeth into uh, the things that you're saying. Yeah, human in the loop, um, you know, the power of the first draft. So if I go back and I took this, sorry, if I took this or I took this, it would have been much easier for me to write the article that I actually ended up eventually writing. One thing that um, I've experimented with, because I think it's, could be really, really powerful is uh, being able to do diagrams in the solve loop. So there are a lot of cases, uh, often in networking or in hardware configurations, there are a lot of cases where a diagram would be really helpful. And just to show you an example of that, and one of the publicly available articles from NetApp, there was this diagram about, uh, you know, how, how a kind of phone home capability gets set up securely. And this is a lovely diagram. Uh, it tells me a time sequence and what happens and who the players are and what part of the players, you know, what, what each of those components has. And um, so this is a really great thing. However, in traditional KCS, this would be a evolve loop content, right? It would be something that you don't do in the course of working and documenting a single case. It's something that would be after the fact. And I know nothing. I haven't talked to the NetApp people about this at all. But just looking at this, I strongly suspect a graphical professional was involved in the creation of this. Right. And so if there was a graphics person, somebody who's good at making nice looking diagrams like this and nice looking clear diagrams like this, um, then they didn't, you know, they didn't know this stuff off the top of their head. So there would have to have been a, another person 
who is a subject matter expert who is working with them. So definitively evolve loop and as, as useful it is, is you're not going to be able to do it except in your relatively short head of content uh, stuff where you can invest extra in. So I took as a challenge, can we recreate this diagram and do it quickly enough that it could plausibly be done in the small loop? So this is what I provided. And I will tell you, this took a number of iterations. Um, it, certainly all the early iterations were not fast enough to do in the solve loop. Um, and, and even once I got some practice under my belt, uh, it, it still took some time and the results are still imperfect. Speaking of imperfect, there's a really funny line in here which is, um, that wasn't a funny line. Oh, do not generate hexadecimal numbers. And why on earth would I put that in a prompt? Well, because after I'd been iterating on these a few times, it started randomly throwing hex codes in the middle of the, uh, the code that drew the diagram, which meant that the thing that drew the diagram, the, the viewer would choke on it. Why did it start putting hex numbers in the code? Your guess is as good as mine. But if I told it not to, it wouldn't. So you're just going to run into some weirdness and kind of have to roll with it. So what this generated was this. And, and interestingly to me, um, what GPT-4 picked was a sequence diagram. It wasn't, uh, so it looked different than the kind of architecture diagram that was in the actual knowledge base. But for those of you who've done networking, actually, I think a sequence diagram is a really good way to talk about what happened, right? You, you, you start at the top and you go to the bottom. That's why on the left, trust store, you know, is at the top and the bottom. It's there the whole time, right? And then it shows the sequence of what communications are going back and forth in what order over time. Um, so I think it actually been a while since I'd seen a sequence diagram, but I think what it picked here um, was, was very clear, perhaps even more clear than the original. Now, it's missing some stuff. It is not attractive. The first article that was created by humans um, looked nice. And again, I'm sure we, we could improve on this. But the fact that we could create something that explained a complicated event like this and to do it um, without involving a graphical professional uh, encouraged me. So that was a case where there was a uh, there was a, a diagram, and I tried to recreate it. And then I I visited our friends who do KCS well at Geotab, and um, in in this case they're they're trying to troubleshoot um, some kind of a short circuit that's between their device and what the vehicle is telling you. And so this is a great KB article. Clear tells you just what to do. This is not my area of expertise at all, but I feel like I could do it up until the point uh, where it says go to the, you know, troubleshoot the electrical wiring in the vehicle, at which point I would be very much out of luck. But um, up until there, uh, it's, it's, it's very clear. So I was looking at this article and I thought, you know, this might be thing something where a simple little diagram that lays out these troubleshooting steps might help. And it turns out the prompt for this was incredibly simple. Right? I just I really just took what was in the knowledge base article and put it out here. And what I got again is not going to win any beauty awards by any stretch of the imagination. But I actually think it would be a nice addition to the article. 
to just lay out, okay, step one, here's what you do. We bypass the, um, we replace the initial step two, bypass the harness and go straight to the onboard diagnostic, onboard diagnostics port. And then after that, you're kind of out of luck. Um, good luck with your vehicle. So, uh, you know, I, I think that this illustrates in a way that at least for some learning styles would be a really good complement to that article. So in terms of kind of the things that I'm most excited about from my little experiments, uh, this ability to create diagrams um, in potentially in the solve loop is, is, a, is a biggie for me. Something I'm not going to spend much time on is uh, the ability to do data analysis. So in the Evolve loop, one of the challenges that KCS presents managers primarily is that it provides a lot of data and central to KCS is that you need to look at and understand a lot of data and the relationships among those data to be able to figure out what's actually going on with an individual, with a team, with the program, right? So there is a, um, in, in my, our slide deck about this, we have a picture of an airplane cockpit, which has lots of dials and gauges. And that's because you can't fly an airplane without understanding all that data and how it's working together. You can't like simplify this down to a airplane goodness index, right? You need to know all this stuff. And, you know, we get pushback from managers that this takes, you know, a lot more effort than the things they're used to about counting cases and service levels and, um, you know, average handle time or time to resolve. So um, we did some experimentation with, um, looking at a team's data, in this case, it was link rate data, and uh, finding out, you know, who the outliers are, who are the people you need to look at. And you can do this with more complicated data sets. Anyhow, this is a pretty well understood use case. But I think that in a KCS context, it's something that can really help managers keep on top of the fact that they need to triangulate among um, lots of different data points. Consortium team, I have not been keeping up with the chat recently. Is there anything that um, that we should stop and talk about or reflect on? No, I think it's, it's uh, great, all the observations that people are uh, bringing in. Some of the observations were that the graphics are a good first draft, but would need to be polished. <laughs> but it's interesting that, you know, these days uh, they're using Gen AI to develop masterpieces too. So I, I have a feeling it's part of just the evolution of um, giving the proper prompts and such. Yeah. And ac actually, um, and, and this is, this is taking me sort of to the edge of my technical understanding, but um, you know, we've seen in Gen AI, we've seen these kind of two parallel threads you know, the, the image thing, the dollies of the world, and the text thing. And um, when I initially started trying this diagram stuff, I said, well, diagrams and images should go look at the image ones. And um, in terms of sort of controlling what's going on, labeling anything, um, it was just not very good. So I got stuff that I could manually label later and that was visually more attractive than what we just saw, but it didn't seem like that was the right solution. So in the text-based thing, the hack there was using plant UML, uh, a, you know, a language for describing diagrams and having it generate that, which it could, and there may be better languages than plant UML to do that. So I kind of, in that, I kind of made an image generation problem, I turned it into a text generation problem. Now, I have no particular insight into this, but I have to imagine that people are looking at how are we going to combine these two technologies together to have something that does text and images well. And uh, and so I think that that's going to be the, the future there. 
I'd also, in terms of needing to be polished, we're in the KCS world. And I would say that onboard diagnostic troubleshooting diagram that we looked at, it was sufficient to solve. It's not beautiful, but the article would be better with it, in my opinion, than without it. There is a use case that I hear over and over and over and over again. And that is, wouldn't it be great if we could just throw our case notes at the AI and have it come up with a KCS article, high quality KCS article? I'm initially sad to report that I never got this to work especially well. I mean, I got things in the right format and stuff, but I, I, I never got an article that I would be proud to put in the knowledge base. And, and so I was, I was sad and depressed. And then I thought a little bit more and I sort of stopped thinking as an AI experimenter. And I started thinking as a KCS professional. And I'm wondering, is that the is that the right use case? So I I think you know my observation about what's working and what's not working about take these case notes and turn them into a knowledge based article is that the the tool's good at summarizing and identify conclusions. We've seen that bulletizing. We've seen that um, it, it's pretty good at taking statements and deciding well is this a symptom? Is this part of a resolution, right? It's not 100%, but it does an okay job there. And just in terms of the mechanical nature, you know, one of the translations that people sometimes struggle with in KCS as they're learning is the fact that they're used to writing case notes, which is a log of what happened. And in a KCS article, what you're doing is telling people what to do the next time it happens, right? And so, you know, that's a that's a grammatical as well as a mindset change. And it it can do that. What I didn't feel comfortable about was seeing, you know, what what really matters, what's the essence of what's going on here. If it were to happen the next time, what are the essential steps that we need to do? That example that we looked at where it gave a numbered series of steps based on the summary, um, most of them were kind of frothy, right? Um like check that this is the right issue. Yeah, that's probably a good thing to do before applying a resolution. So again, as a KCS professional and maybe just a little bit of a curmudgeon, I, I'm wondering, is, is, is this just a good use case? And where I've landed is no, actually, I don't, I don't think this is a desirable use case. Uh, I, I think that there is real benefit in capturing and structuring in the workflow rather than just doing a brain dump of what happened perhaps after the fact and you know somehow have the ai genie turn that into a knowledge base article and what i started thinking of when i was thinking about this was kempner trigo so kempner trigo is a you know long established and quite heavyweight approach for solving problems. Well, approach for doing a number of things, solving problems is one of them. And when you're doing the 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 problem solving part of KT, you fill out forms. You fill out pretty complicated forms. Like I said, it's a it's a heavyweight process. Now it doesn't have you fill out forms for the sake of filling out forms, all right? It's not, it does not have a documentation fetish. It's not having you fill out forms for the purpose of creating knowledge base articles, although that actually, that actually works and it can be helpful. Now, the reason that they're having you fill out the form is they're trying to provide clarity to you about what is and what is not going on, what the situation on the ground is. And by having this structure, 
they're hoping to guide you through a good problem solving process and to guide you through to eventually a resolution. And our KCS articles, a lightweight version of that. I remember uh, talking with Greg Oxton years ago uh, when he was with the consortium about, you know, we see that once people have come up the learning curve, that it takes them no extra time to write a knowledge base article, right? As they're working a case. Now, by rights, it should, you know, because they've got to you know, do some cleanup, add some bullets, add some metadata, change the the uh, article confidence, right? There, there are things that they need to do, but in aggregate, once people get the hang of it, it doesn't seem to add time as compared with before. And we speculated that the reason was the article structure, right? And and the way that that's reflected back in the case, hopefully. And it just helps you think through things. So I really think there's virtue here. And I don't think that, so Pat said this right in the beginning, right? If you don't have good case notes, how are you possibly going to turn it into a, a good article? Um, and I think maybe just capturing something that looks an awful lot like an article up front, first, it makes it easier if anybody else gets involved in the case, whether you do, you know, some kind of a handoff to follow the sun or you escalate or, you know, you're asking people to join in to help you on the case through swarming. In any of these cases, like having a place to go where you can see in a simple structured way, the summary of what we know to date is super useful. And like in the KT example, it, it does uh, it does help with structuring the problem solving process. And remember, one of the big ideas of why KCS captures in the workflow is so we don't lose the customer's context. Now, we ordinarily talk about that as the customer, what the customer tells us, and that's really important to capture in the moment. But we also are the only people who know what we told the customer and what made them happy what made them whole, right? And so we should capture that in the process of delivering it rather than later, because that's in its own way, even though it's our voice, it's the customer's context because we're responding to what the customer needs to hear and whatever explanations they need and so on. So if somebody much more clever than I am with prompts can figure out how to make uh, case notes, unstructured case notes, a, a, a good KCS article. Um, I, I'm I'm kind of with Jeff here. I think that um, that it may be better actually to have people follow the KCS process, and then we have lots of good ways, um, and many many more to come. I'm sure of having generative AI help the KCS process. So with that, let's see what is so much good stuff in the chat. I've been watching it go by. I again can't really can't wait to um to to read this. Um Brian uh, uh makes a, a great observation. Is anyone else seeing pressure to replace conventional search with gen AI? Uh Absolutely. And I didn't even kind of bring this up as a not good use case, but, you know, it's really funny to me that, you know, in a KCS world, we often run into the fact that senior leaders, executives don't trust their own people to create knowledge based content, their own smart people who they hired and trained and developed and continue to support. They often don't trust them to create knowledge-based content. And yet, all of a sudden, we've got this technology that does awfully clever things that we know hallucinates. It makes up answers we know can say and do stereotyping um, and, you know, and, and hurtful and inappropriate um, uh, comments right? Because 
it was trained with the real world's training data. And there's a lot about the real world that isn't right. You know, we don't want to emulate. And all of a sudden, these same execs are happy to just kind of set this loose to answer questions. So I, I believe, um, you know, I, I attended a really fascinating vendor uh, presentation about uh, how you can combine search and retrieval and then look at the articles that were retrieved and figure out how to present that in a more conversational way, which really cuts down on, um, you know, kind of the, the, the randomness. So I'm sure there is goodness there. But this idea of uh, I'm just going to toss our knowledge-based content to one of these systems and have it make up answers, um, I think is 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 very rash. Good first step for starting out with that, Jessica. Thanks for asking. Um, first, I have to say again, not my area of expertise. Check with your you know legal risk compliance CISO, right? Because there are there are real concerns with experimenting with real data that is proprietary to you or maybe even reflect customer data. So 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 make sure you're you're solid there. And if you need to anonymize or figure out some way to make the data um, appropriate to send work on that. And then I would just look at your pain points. I would look at, you know, in your KCS program as you know, you 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 you've brought this discipline that your expert in to an organization that perhaps hasn't done it before. So what are the pain points people are running into, especially in the solve loop? And if there are things that, you know, like, like the three we looked at generating a title, picking an article template, or, you know, structuring in more of a KCS way, um, those are all pretty simple and straightforward things. If there are things that you can find that, are in that nature, um, that's where I would start experimenting. But, you know, I would not right now sign up to deliverables, um, you know, within a certain amount of time frame. I really believe that we're in find the right use case and experiment mode. And that's what I do. And that's what I'd promise. And after you have something promising, then build a plan around that. Well, we are almost at time. I want to thank you so much, and um, I will uh, I will go through the chat and I will uh, respond, if I may, to yep. individuals. I'll send the information back to the consortium. And yeah, and thank you so much, David. This was a great conversation. And thanks for everyone participating in the chat. I thought we had really really nice um, discussion there. So thank you, and uh, you all have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.